In this video, we're going to look at cell theory. And this is kind of an introduction to the cell, and we'll look at the cell in more detail in class. We're going to start with the question, what does it mean to be alive? Now that sounds like kind of a philosophical question, but we're going to look at it sort of from a biological perspective. If we say something is living, what does that mean? <clears throat> well, all living things carry out metabolism. That's a word you've heard before, probably. Metabolism just refers to the chemical reactions within a cell. Uh, we could divide it up into two types of reactions. There's reactions where you have larger molecules, like glucose, being broken down into smaller molecules, like CO2 and, and water. So this is uh, cellular respiration. This is a very important reaction that happens in our mitochondria. We'll study that later in the unit. <clears throat> anyway, when, cell, when reactions go from large molecules into smaller components, that's called catabolism. And when they go in the opposite direction, when smaller molecules combine to make larger ones, that's called anabolism. And an example of that would be the opposite of cellular respiration, which some of you might know is photosynthesis. Another thing, that another characteristic of living things is that they respond to stimuli. Now, uh, if <clears throat> something responds quickly to a stimulus, like let's say you put your hand on a hot stove, and you pull it away. I don't know why you would put your hand on a hot stove, but let's say you did, and you pull it away. That would be called behavior. Um, when something responds more slowly to a stimulus, such as this plant that's growing towards the light, that's called tropism. And in this particular case, if you want to learn a fancy new word, it would be phototropism. Photo means light. And tropism is this slower behavior, the slower response to a stimulus. Other characteristics of living things. They maintain homeostasis. This is a concept that's going to come up repeatedly throughout the course. Growth. Living things grow. Maybe very slowly, but they grow. Living things reproduce. And they acquire nutrients and excrete waste. And living things are made of cells. Okay, we didn't know this until a few hundred years ago when <clears throat> scientists started playing around with microscopes um, and found that living things were all made of cells. And that was a very exciting time. And cell theory, well, it might seem like common sense, it actually took several decades to put together. The first part of cell theory is that living organisms are made of cells. And that cells are the smallest unit of life. Are there things smaller than cells? Yes, but they're not considered living. And what seems like a logical thought today, cells come from pre-existing cells. So if you think about your own body, and scientists think you are about a hundred trillion cells, you all came, you came from a union between two cells, a sperm and an egg. And uh, even unicellular organisms carry out all the functions of life. <clears throat> so as we're describing this, you might be thinking of a human, because that's what we tend to do, but remember this includes all living things, even little unicellular bacteria, like these E. coli. Breaking news, cells are small. How small are they? Well, here we have a range of objects and their sizes up top. And um, so if you see <clears throat> DNA, DNA appears to be approximately 10 nanometers. So a uh, nano refers to a billionth, 10 to the power of negative 9, that's nano. So 
a nanometer would be that many meters. <clears throat> Viruses are 10 times bigger at 100 nanometers. Um, bacteria, bacteria range in size, but they're approximately a nanometer. Oh, sorry, a micrometer. A micrometer is 10 to the power of negative 6 meters, or a millionth of a meter. <clears throat> and these objects are so small that um, you might be able to see bacteria with a light microscope, but that would be about it. To see a virus, you would need an electron microscope. And we can't see any of these things with the naked eye. Even individual cells, which are up to about uh, between 10, about 10 micrometers, we can't even see with the naked eye. So you are responsible for knowing the relative sizes of cells, bacteria, viruses, and DNA. And you should know the uh, SI units, nanometers and micrometers. <clears throat> And this might seem like a silly question, but why are cells so small? Well, this diagram helps us understand that the answer lies in the surface area to volume ratio. Now, if we, if we look at these cubes, no cells aren't cubes like this, but it gets the point across. If we look at this cube that's one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter, well, the surface area would be you know, one side, one by one. That's one square millimeter times the six sides. So surface area is six square millimeters. The volume would be length times width times the depth, which is one millimeter cubed. So the surface area to volume ratio here is six to one, or we could divide 6 by 1 and to say the surface area to volume ratio is 6. <clears throat> now let's see what happens if the cell grows. If the length is going to double to 2 millimeters, the surface area now is 2 by 2, which is 4 square millimeters, times the 6 sides, 24 square millimeters. The volume, 2 times 2 times 2, is 8 cubic millimeters. The surface area to volume ratio in this case is 3. Okay, and so you can see that as the cell gets bigger, the surface area does increase and the volume also increases, but the volume increases at a faster rate, which means the surface area to volume ratio goes down. And we'll see why that's important in the next slide. <clears throat> as the cell grows, so does the rate of resource consumption. Right? These are the nutrients that the cell needs. So does the amount of waste produced, and so does the heat produced in the chemical reactions of the cell. All of these things are a function of the cell's volume. However, the, uh, the rate, that, rate of exchange of materials, so this just means the rate that things can get back and forth across the cell membrane, and energy, heat, which would leave the cell, uh, all of this is a function of the surface area. And as we saw from the, the diagram before, as the cell grows, the surface area to volume ratio decreases. <clears throat> so here we see if when the, when the length of the one side of the cube was about one, and in our picture, we had a volume of six. Right, and you can see here, as the cube gets bigger, the surface area to volume ratio goes down. And so it just becomes more and more difficult for the cell to get those nutrients it needs, um, to get them into the center of the cell, and to get rid of all the waste. Eventually it reaches a point where it just is no longer efficient and it cannot continue to grow. <coughs> Hey, another uh, concept in this unit is that multicellular organisms show emergent properties. Now this, this is a, a concept in biology which is a little bit different from reductionism. So in, in reductionism, 
this is kind of the traditional this is sort of the traditional method in science where we take complex things and break them down into their component parts so it's like if we could understand every single chemical reaction in a cell we would be able to understand the cell so we we break down the cell and we try to learn about all those little pieces <clears throat> okay that's called reductionism and that's kind of to traditional science but the multi this emergent properties is is saying that even if we know lots about the individual parts we can't predict the properties that will occur when all those parts are together uh, a simple way to sort of think of it is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts okay and a good analogy would be the watch so we could we could know each of these little parts but if you were given all the parts like this you wouldn't know the properties when they all get put together you get a, a, a functioning watch um, <clears throat> sort of a biological example would be this is this is uh, cells from in a heart so this is these are these are a heart, this is actually a heart cell that's dividing into two so this is called cardio for heart uh, myo which means muscle and site which means cell so this is a cardio myocyte okay now <clears throat> is this cell alive well yeah by our definition of living it, it meets all the criteria and you could say it the cell is alive but it's pretty useless all by itself it needs a whole bunch of those cells working together to make a tissue And even then, the tissue is kind of useless, <laughs> unless the tissue is combined with some other types of tissue to make an organ. And in this case, the organ is the heart. Okay, and then that organ would be part of an organ system, in this case, the cardiovascular system. And it would be linked with other systems to make a living organism. The concept of emergent properties, we could look at it within one organism, but we could also apply it to populations and entire ecosystems. So <clears throat> here's an example of a termite mound. So all those termites working together, having a surprising, unpredictable property uh, when they build these massive termite mounds. Or a kelp forest, a few kelp plants grow and change it change the entire ecosystem okay how many cells are you uh, anywhere from 500 trillion to 100 trillion depending on which textbook you look at <clears throat> it's kind of neat to think that you started as a union between two cells a sperm and an egg now how do cells know how to become a particular cell type when you think about all the variety of cells in your body how do they know how to do that well, the hint here is this picture, which you probably recognize is, is DNA. And in the DNA, there's segments of the DNA called genes, which are the instructions for this differentiation, as it's called. <clears throat> Here's another diagram that shows if you shows the entire cell, and if you could zoom in on a chromosome, and if you could zoom in on part of that chromosome, you would see a coil of DNA, and it's double helix and one segment of that <clears throat> might be a gene and we have about 30 to 40,000 genes in the human body and it's neat to think that every cell in your body contains all of your genes <clears throat> so the example I sometimes use in classes there are cells in your eye that have the genes for making insulin which is something your pancreas does Right, so why is it that your eye doesn't make insulin? Well, the genes are there, but they're not activated, and they're not turned on. Now, most cells are very specific. Right? You think about a, a neuron or a rod cell in your eye, 
they're very specific. But there are some types, some cells, that have the ability to differentiate into a variety of cell types. You might have heard of these. They're called stem cells. There are uh, different types of stem cells, <clears throat> and it just depends on what they have the potential to differentiate into. So if we look at the names of these, uh, totipotent stem cell. Well, toti just refers to uh, potential. Or sorry, toti refers to total. So you can think of it like total potential. And these stem cells can turn into many different types of other cells, all other types of cells. Uh, pluripotent stem cells. A pluri it sounds kind of funny, but it means very many. So it's just sort of like a little bit less. There's some cells that it can't turn into. And multipotent and multi means many. So it can still differ differentiate, but not quite as much. Now there's um, <clears throat> some some ethical issues um, involved with using stem cells for therapy um, because stem cells have the potential to turn into various other types of cells scientists are experimenting with using them to turn into organs uh, which could potentially in the future be used for transplant. Uh, organs made by stem cells have some benefits over organs from organ donors and that they're made of your cells so the body recognizes them as self and won't attack them so people that get organ people that get organ transplants often have to take immunosuppressant drugs to weaken their immune system so that their immune systems don't attack the organ. That wouldn't happen if we were able to use stem cells. But there's lots of ethical issues about where these stem cells come from, and that's a discussion we'll have.